All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Eric McNulty, who is in Boston, Massachusetts. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing great, John. Good to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. And Eric is a seasoned business writer, speaker, and thought leader, uh, author, uh, one of the authors of the book, Your It Crisis Change and How to Lead When It Matters Most, uh, widely published, widely quoted. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is exactly that subject, is leading in turbulent times. And um, when I was preparing for this, I just said to, <laughs> said to Eric, leading in turbulent times like are there any other kind of times these days uh i always like i always look at it uh, so i came to the states as i'm originally from ireland i came to the states in the late 90s like for mid to late 90s uh to silicon valley for the dot com so i've seen the dot com explosion implosion um we had 9 11 we had the financial crisis we had COVID, and now who knows what's next but it seems it seems eric that we're going to have to get used to these recurring crises of one magnitude or another coming along at probably more regular intervals, it looks like. Absolutely. You know, we had the underlying conditions for relative stability for most of the second half of the 20th century as we moved into the 21st uh, between the, the demographic changes, climate change, the, the rapid advance of technology, it making us much more tightly interconnected. We are seeing uh, disruption happening more frequently and its impacts felt around the world much more much more rapidly than ever before. So indeed, we are, li we are living in turbulent times and I think we will be for the next several decades. Um, and yeah, and so and so the fact that we're living in turbulent times and these and there and there are no small turbulences either, uh, given the fact that we're used to. I mean, we have we have little turbulences, little crises uh, on a regular basis, but now we have these big ones. It really is a, it really is a challenge to how to lead going forward. I mean, this because. Um, Let's face it, most people from leaders, you know, they look for it, you know, they want to be just reassured and all of that stuff. And and leaders are now leading in a time of, well, you know, they're operating with less information or less certain or less facts than they've ever been because of how fluid situations are. So how where do you start as a leader to be able to 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 lead in a situation that's so fluid and, you know, may need potential pivots and and not just one but multiple well the first thing you want to do is to ground yourself and you do that in your values you do it in some some basic practices like meditative breathing which will calm down your heart rate and you just want to get your feet on the ground and and feel solid there um, that's the first thing you want to what my colleagues and I call come out, come out of the emotional basement that a crisis will send you into. And you want to do that again. Look to your values, look to things you know how to do and just begin to take some action. And then you want to do the same for the team around you and make sure people are engaged and, and doing something that they, where they feel productive. Because once you feel productive, you stop the panic response. And you, know, you can't always stop the, the uh, precipitating incident that causes the disaster or the crisis to begin but you can always prevent the secondary crisis of a fumbled response. And you do that by grounding yourself, making sure you're thinking clearly, get your regulate your emotions so that you're calm and confident. That's what our research at Harvard shows. The first thing people look for in a leader is, is that person confident? Is that person calm? Or are they panicked? And if, because if you're panicked as a leader, everyone around you is going to panic. So settle yourself down, settle them down. Then you can figure out what's going on and what you're going to do about it. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point, and and let's face it, I mean, uh, calm and cool and calm are two things that don't that seem to be in rather short supply today because we have, and regardless of you know, we have hysterical politicians on all sides, uh, we have hysterical media, we have hysterical social social media, so all the all the kind of if you like popular culture or cultural things are 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 constantly. Uh, bombarding us with with just uh, with with chaos, but with emotional responses and stuff. So, it's it's almost in this world that you have to take a step away from it and go. No, I'm not going to go in that direction. I'm going to go in the direction of centering myself. And that, and that's a that's a to be honest, it's a big challenge nowadays. 
Yes. And I always take a lesson from a person who used to work for me and she was brilliant when there would be a, you know, I call it a quote unquote crisis because I think we need to reclaim the word crisis to be those mm -hmm. truly big threatening events, <laughs> but something routine would go on. You, you know, you lose a contract or you would have a speaker for a conference, not show up or the internet would go down and she would stop and say, is anyone bleeding from the head? Because if they're mm -hmm. not, we can solve this. And if they are, I know who to call and they can fix this. And so by putting things in perspective and again, re reclaiming that crisis, because as, as bad as it may feel to have a, a setback today and something doesn't go right, you know, imagine if you were a couple of months ago, had significant operations in Ukraine. If you mm -hmm. had to deal with that, that's a crisis. You've got lives on the line. You've got serious operational capabilities that may be impacted. Those are the big crises. If you were in Texas a couple of winters ago and the grid went down, um, that's a crisis. Uh, the rest of these things that uh, these day-to-day -day interruptions and disruptions, as you say, the media and others like to hype them up like it's the end of the world. It's not. You got to keep your perspective as a leader and say, what's really a big threat and what's a, a minor, minor threat that we can deal with? It may be bad, but we can deal with it. Yeah, no, I love that. I, I love uh, I love what your colleague used to say. Yeah, well, I used to always say like we're lucky we're in a business where you know at our worst nobody dies, right? Even right. it doesn't matter how badly we screw things up, nobody dies, and and we can always fix it. But I like what you the the comment that you made there about reclaiming the word crisis because yes, it, it has become it's like everything is elevated to the level of crisis, um, regardless regardless of, of how serious it is, and I think that. I think within, uh, especially within organizations and with leaders, if it's up to leaders to reclaim that and sort of say, you know, here is a, you know, here's an issue we need to overcome. Here is an obstacle. Here's something that we need to react to. But, but as I say, like not to, not to elevate it when it doesn't need to be elevated. And that, that's absolutely right. And, you know, as a, as a leader among the key skills you have are sense making and meaning making. So sense making what's going on, how bad is it? How long will it last? How big, you know, will the impact be? And then the meaning making is, you know, what are the implications for us individually as an organization? How are we going to deal with this? And how can I contribute to the solution? When you get people involved in solving problems, that it inevitably call, it calms them down because again they're being productive. They've, they're exhibiting about a, some of what we uh, academics call agency, but they're able to to contribute to be part of something. And once you're part of something and you're engaged in productive action, you calm down, you get focused, and you're much better able to deal with whatever's come your way. Um, yeah, and and the other thing I just wanted to come back to you mentioned earlier was the concept of values, uh, because I think this is something that's largely overlooked um it's not talked about enough and i think many people sometimes through no fault of their own never actually spend any time figuring out what their own values truly are um and you don't have to have you know it's not like you have to have a bunch of them normally as you get older i think we shrink them down to having some really core non-negotiables but you do have to go through a process of identifying what those are and that's something i think that uh, it's uh, that that many people just overlook yeah, I think they somewhat take them for granted. And it's one of the good things we saw. We So my colleagues and I did some research with nine global companies looking at their lessons learned through COVID and wanted to get some cross-industry, see what, what things crossed over different industries. And, and one of the ones that came through were CEOs who acted in concert with the organization's values. So when they said, we're taking care of people first, they said, okay, what do we need to do to take care of people? We'll figure out the business case later. I'm not worried about the nickels and dimes right now. Do the right thing. And so when you're, as you say, when you're clear about your values personally and as an organization, and then you act on them. So they become living a part of your day-to-day -day operations and the way you act. They have real power. And that gives people something to hold on to in the midst of the chaos of a crisis. If we know we're going to act in a certain way, that we have certain non-negotiables and we're going to stick with them, that creates some certainty amidst the chaos that can be very reassuring. Yeah, no, I, I would I would totally agree with that. And and therefore, I think it's a very important exercise for people to go through. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to mention to you is I worked for a company, actually the company that brought me over here during the dot com and uh, the executive leadership at the time were great in a crisis. Oh, they loved it. They got us all together. We'd jump on planes, we'd fly to customers, we'd fix everything. It'd be wonderful. We'd slap each other on the back. And then we jump on planes and go back to wherever we had come from. 
but never fix the issues. We were great. <laughs> there was they were great crisis managers, and they almost it's almost like they actually enjoyed it because they mm -hmm. were kind of enjoyable in their own perverse way. Um, but but that's no being great in a crisis is fine as long as you're working diligently towards not having crises <laughs> and certainly self inflicted ones. <laughs> No, absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, one of the things we, we talk about is that, you know, a good day is when a disaster doesn't become a crisis, that you're able mm -hmm. to act, you're pro proactive, you get in there, you mitigate the damage and you move. And hopefully, and when you're doing it well, you're looking at what is the root cause of this and how do we solve it so it doesn't happen again? Because you're right, the, the sort of firefighting aspect of things it, is addictive. There's an adrenaline rush, yeah. you come in, you're wearing your cape and tights and you come in and, you know, save the day. <laughs> And, and that's you know as long as you do it well is is uh, can be very can feel very gratifying. But as you say, that's not the way to run a business. You want to be doing that when you have to, but you actually need to remember the lower drama moments of building the systems in that that aren't going to fail. That have and and developing people so they are resilient individually and as teams, so that they solve the problems before they get to become a crisis. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's high time we all hung up our tights. I think um, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but 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 it, but it is an interesting it is an interesting uh, it, it is an interesting human trait of human nature that we we love all that we love the adrenaline rush. So so tell me what are some of the things that you see maybe some of the newer skills or even skills that maybe need more um, focus on that leaders uh, leaders will need moving into the future given the fact that the world isn't going to get any more certain anytime soon. And, you know, who knows with monkey pox and God knows what <laughs> else we're going to be, we're going to be lurching from crisis to crisis, but what are some of the skills that leaders will need going forward so that they can manage through, through, you know, small crisis, big crisis or whatever, but in a controlled manner. You know, I, I'll give you two. One is the importance of character. We trust at an all-time low in institutions. Business does better than government, media, or nonprofits, but not by much. Um, and so your character as a leader, can people count on you? Are you trustworthy? That's absolutely central to your ability to lead. And then the second is building connectivity, building relationships across organizational boundaries, across sectors, so that you're connected to a wider network that you can link, where you can link and leverage resources, capabilities, expertise to begin to both solve problems, but also seize opportunities. And so leaders, less as, as a singular hero and more as, as the bridge builder, relationship builder, you're looking at that team uh, approach or a, a good network approach. So focus on your character, who you are, and then be building those relationships because in this world that's so fast paced and so tightly connected, rarely can you uh, solve a crisis alone. You're gonna to need to draw on other people in an organization. So best to know them ahead of time rather than trying to do it in the moment. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point because let's face it, in traditional leadership, you, you almost felt that you, you that you had to at least have some of the answer or know the answer. And the, the world is so complicated today that you can't possibly. And therefore, I think as a leader, you have to, as you pointed out, you have to become better at co-opting the right people and gathering and and you and and different challenges will need different groups of people so i think kind of assembling and disassembling kind of teams is is quite is quite a skill that will be needed absolutely and it will be that ability you know my colleague in harvard business school amy edmondson calls it teaming so it's not a permanent mm -hmm. team but it's bringing people in and out and knowing how to assemble them as you say disassemble them and work more fluidly uh because you're right as a leader now it's it's important to have the right questions and then be able to find the people with the right answers because things are too complex. You're not going to have all the answers, uh, but your ability to bring people together, get them focused and get them productive and then end it. You know, ending something, particularly a crisis, is much harder than starting it. Uh, turning something back on and, and getting people back into a normal routine after that adrenaline rush and after all the, the push to do something that's so high stakes. Uh, but you're going to have to be able to pivot back to doing your more routine business. And that's a, that's a key skill as well. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and Amy's a good friend of the the show here, so we've had her on before. Great, uh, great insights as well. Um, so I was just writing down here because uh, you know, what you were saying here about um, about asking the right questions, and I think that is I think that's a very powerful thing because that is really flipping 
flipping the script on what many people perceive as leadership yes. is you're not you're not always providing the answers you're actually asking the right questions and I, and I think this is a this is a key skill that has been lost the whole art of of questioning and listening is, is something that's at a premium especially in this world where we're bombarded with devices absolutely and you know, asking questions in the right way. So asking open-ended questions or specifically saying, John, how do you see this? Or who sees this differently? Because often we can ask questions where essentially we're asking for agreement. You know, yeah. does, everyone, does everyone agree with what I said? If, if you're the boss, of course, everyone's going to shake their heads. It takes a lot mm -hmm. of courage to go against that. But asking questions in a way that you know people have different perspectives to uh, to bring to the table. One of the, the ways I like to, when I coach leaders, is to say, you know, start with the idea that no one has all of the answer and everyone may have part of it. So your job mm -hmm. is to get those parts and bring them together, get them on the table so you can see the puzzle and put it together. And that does not matter, you know, that quiet person, make sure you bring them into the conversation. Don't let them get overshadowed by the, by the extroverts who are always trying to, trying to speak up, but get everybody involved and ask those questions that really probe and, and that and by asking the right question, show that you're open to difficult truths you're open to contrary opinions uh and and you want to get a full understanding of what's happening yeah and, and i think that's obviously a, a, a big challenge as uh, you say you have to because if you're if you have the right values and if you're confident in yourself then you can open yourself up for for that kind of dialogue if you're not then maybe that's something that you need to to start working on because as we said you're number one you're not going to be able to do this alone and second off i mean people disengage after a while clearly if they think yeah these these are it's nice to be involved in these conversations but they don't really go anywhere and it's always whatever his you know his or hers uh, opinion in the end that counts so i think that that whole a whole idea of facilitation i mean i think leaders as as facilitators as much as leaders is a really is a really powerful and a concept and i think one that's going to become more and more important yes and i think you know one of the reasons we we called the book your it is because your is both singular and plural so there is a role mm -hmm. for the individual and something you have to do to be able to to bring about the best possible result but part of that is bringing people together to create that collective whole and that is, again, bringing people into the conversation, recognizing the different strengths and expertise you have throughout the organization and being willing to tap into them and, and realizing that it is only together that you're going to to meet these significant challenges. So it's it's you, but it's more much more than you, you know, at, at the same time. And that's part of the paradox of leading. Yeah, and and I think the other part too is that uh, you know nowadays um, it started before the pandemic, but obviously the pandemic accelerated it. You know, we have a lot of changes in the way companies are structured, in the way where people are situated, where the in office is virtual, half and half, whether they're you know the other side of the globe, whether they're external contractors who are on long term contracts who kind of feel like employees but they're not. So being able to communicate and bring everybody in um, may be a little bit more difficult than just saying everybody into the you know you lot into the conference room <laughs> for a brainstorm session but it's not impossible and in some ways it actually can give voice to the people who have been a little bit voiceless in the past that's right if you structure properly that's why i think it's so important you mentioned the role of leader as facilitator because part of what you need to be able to bring is that ability to bring the, you know, the to get different people to contribute to the conversation, um, not in ways that feel they feel put upon, but in ways they feel invited in, and uh, that is a skill that's one I've had to develop as an educator. That's one other you know, leaders have to develop as well to be able to read the room, see who you know. You almost can sense that question or that comment somebody's trying to make, but they're almost afraid to do it, and be able to pull that out of them. And and then getting used to the online tools. I mean, one of the my, actually my next column for strategy and business is about getting the basics right. In that we've introduced so many new tools over the last you know two to five years mm -hmm. in terms of online collaboration and workflow and and, and such that we actually have, have done too little work to ensure that we're actually really good at using the tools we're going to use. We sort of throw them out there and say, you know, great online whiteboard, go brainstorm, have a good time. But what are the real skills needed to, to use that and use it really, really well? And for, for organizations to around how they organize, how they uh, how they communicate, how they collaborate. Pick which pick how you're going to do it and make sure your people get have the, the resources to get really, really good at it. 
Uh, because again, in the crisis, if you have to move quickly, it's that muscle memory, it's that facility with the, the processes and the tools you want to use that will help get you moving much, much faster. You can be much more proactive uh, attacking an adverse event if you're not trying to figure out you know, how to get onto the Zoom call. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so, and it seems dull and boring and, you know, a bit, we're too busy for that. We're moving too quickly, but, you know, as they say, um, uh, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Um, get, get really good at some of those basics and it will really pay off in terms of the overall organizational effectiveness and efficiency. Yeah, exactly. I'm with the other one, less, less haste, more speed. Um, exactly. something yeah. like that. <laughs> I like but it's that great, one. but it's, yeah, but it's a great, it's a great point that you raise here because I do feel like. And we're probably all guilty of it. Like we've rolled out these tools, and we've uh, and uh, and we've never actually we don't spend enough time actually figuring out how to use them to to the to optimally use them. We just sort of oh we 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 need to use this, so let's just use this. And I think I mean Zoom's a great example. Um, I think during the pandemic, like people have used Zoom for everything, and now are discovering that yeah, well, it actually has limitations, and there are other software that are better for particular things right. um but but to your point is we have to start doing that work so that we're not we're not constantly saying well yeah we're using this tool or we're using that tool but it it's really just a it's really just a temporary fix or a band-aid rather than using it for because we're not going to get away from it no that's right and when we look now at the, whatever you want to call the great reassessment resignation all the mm -hmm. different words for it Part of the way you can you can attract and retain talent is by having a making your workplace an enjoyable place to be, taking some of the friction out of those day to day yeah. interactions. And we know back from the days in the office, the people who were, you know, forever have been running terrible meetings or who can't communicate clearly. And then you're creating workarounds and inefficiencies and all that kind of grates on people. And now it's gotten to the point where they're saying enough is enough. And so I think if you do. If you can learn to, to execute really, really well um, and support people as they grow that capability, you actually make the workplace more cohesive. And we know people love being part of a great team and part of an organization that supports them and where they're they're building skills and where they feel they're contributing. And so getting people really good at some of these, what seem, may seem like mundane uh, matters, actually can pay really big benefits. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think the other part of that is actually um, empowering people to say, okay, you know, maybe it's their first, maybe the pandemic force virtual on you for the first time say, so okay, let's figure this out together. How can we optimize this? Anybody got, you know, other ideas or they've seen other uses or whatever, because I mean, I think, I think the whole, at the essence of what you're saying is that, you know, you facilitate, but we can all learn together and we can improve things together if we're brought together to do it. That's right. That's right. And, and we are, again, learning now how to be brought together virtually as well as brought together in person. And I do think that, you know, the future does hold a, a combination of those things. And even even the teams that are working remotely uh, need to have some physical face to face time uh, because that, uh, you know, back to the beginning of our conversation, it sort of mm -hmm. builds the trust and builds the confidence in each other. Uh, so that you're able to work together under difficult circumstances. And I think, you know, more and more and very quickly, companies are figuring out um, how to begin to do that. And so it's not an either or. And it is uh, how do we get the best of the, the in-person time we spend and, and even spending the money to bring folks from around the world to be together, you know, two, three, four times a year, as well as the benefits of the flexibility of being uh, being distributed. Yeah, in many ways we're kind of spoiled for choice now, so uh, there's no excuse not to be able to to do that. Uh, this all of Eric's information is going to be below this video, but before we go, Eric, please tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. So I'm the associate director of the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative at Harvard University, where we work with leaders on what it takes to excel in high stakes, high stress situations. And we work with people from around the world, private, public sector, combination, uh, to, to really understand the neuroscience, the physiology, the psychology behind what it takes to work through difficult situations and, and build high performance, high commitment teams. So I do that there. I write for strategy and business, the book over my shoulder, and always happy mm -hmm. to engage with folks in LinkedIn, on LinkedIn and elsewhere in interesting conversations about the future of work, organizational culture, and leadership. Yeah, no, fantastic. And as I said, all, all of uh, Eric's information will be below this video. So Eric, Eric, mcnulty.com go check it out check out the work great work you're doing eric uh, 
Thank you for the insights today. Uh, thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you.